I'll call committee back to order. Uh, welcome to uh, members of the public uh, who have joined us um, for our afternoon hearing into the public accounts. Um, we have us with uh, we have with us today uh, staff from the Comptroller General's office. But before we get to the presentation, I'll ask committee members to introduce themselves for the official record, starting with Mr. O'Reilly. Kevin O'Reilly, MLA Framelake. Michael Nadley, MLA for Ditchell. Danny McNeely, Santu Region. RJ Simpson, MLA Hay River North. And I am Kieran Testard, member for Cam Lake and chair of the Standing Committee on Government Operations. And with us today is uh, um, the committee clerk, Michael Ball, and the uh, committee research advisor, Mr. Lee Selleck. And uh, now we'll turn uh, over to uh, Mr. Cooey, uh, if you could introduce yourself and your staff and uh, proceed with any opening comments you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with me today, so my name is Jamie Cooey. I'm the uh, Controller General for the uh, Gene WT Department of Finance. Uh, with me today is uh, Siobhan Emelian, uh, Manager of Financial Reporting and Collections, and also with us is uh, Jessica St. Arnaud, Senior Financial Reporting Advisor. Um, thanks for having us here today to uh, talk about the 2015-16 uh, public accounts of the Government of the Northwest Territories. Uh, the public accounts represent one of the key accountability mechanisms of the GNWT and present the financial position of the consolidated government reporting entity and the results of operations for the fiscal year ended on March 31, 2016. The public accounts provide additional information through notes and schedules. This information is audited by the Auditor General of Canada who expressed an unqualified opinion on the 2016 public accounts. That opinion is contained in the Auditor's Report which forms part of the public accounts. In addition to the information that is audited, the public accounts provide unaudited information which includes a narrative of key financial indicators that provide information on the general financial condition of the GNWT, including if the government met the requirements of its fiscal responsibility policy. The public accounts also include the non-consolidated financial statements of the GNWT, which presents the financial position and operating results of the GNWT departments and the Legislative Assembly. The government reporting entity, which is presented in the consolidated accounts, includes the core GNWT departments, the NWT Business Development and Investment Corporation, the NWT Housing Corporation, all education authorities, Aurora College, all health and social services authorities, the NWT Heritage Fund, the NWT Human Rights Commission, the New Valuate Water Board, the NWT Status of Women Council, the NWT Service Rights Board, the NWT Sport and Recreation Council, as well as Arctic Energy Alliance and the Northwest Territories Hydro Corporation and its subsidiary, the Northwest Territories Power Corporation. It does not include the operations of the Workers' Safety and Compensation Commission. The annual report from the Office of the Auditor General on the results of their audit of the consolidated public accounts is positive overall, a clean audit opinion, noting continued progress by the GNOT over prior years. The 2015-16 consolidated public accounts reflect an increase in net debt this is the difference between financial assets and liabilities. Net debt increased 106 million to 883 million from 777 million at the end of 2015. The annual surplus for the fiscal year was 128 million. The consolidated cash position increased from 78 million to 92 million on a consolidated cash basis. A significant use of the cash not reflected in the statement of operations is the 233 million that was invested in infrastructure. Um, overall borrowing, as defined by the NWT Borrowing Act, was $764 million, which resulted in the government's residual borrowing capacity being $536 million as at March 31, 2016. The financial statement discussion and analysis portion of the public accounts summarizes the government's consolidated financial results as at March 31, 2016. The GNWT is financially stable and can sustain itself, however, it does have limited flexibility to raise financial resources and has vulnerabilities related to revenue sources. This points to the continued need for careful fiscal management. Uh, Mr. Chair, that concludes my opening remarks. Uh, at this time, if the committee agrees, I'd like to go through a short presentation, which mostly provides details to the government's actions towards the committee's recommendations on their review of the 2014-15 public accounts, as well as uh, go through some of the 2015-16 challenges and key highlights. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cooey, does the committee have any questions or comments on Mr. Cooey's opening? Comments? Hearing none, uh, Mr. Cooey, you may proceed with uh, the presentation. 
Well, yeah, I'd like to go through some of the 2015-16 uh, GMT public accounts timing information, uh, as well as go through some of the challenges, um, go through some of the 2014-15 committee recommendations and actions taken by government, uh, go through some of the 2015-16 highlights, as well as uh, a couple slides on the 2016-17 GMT public accounts. Uh, so slide three, uh, the interim financial report was completed by September 30th as required under uh, the Financial Administration Act. It was provided to the committee on September 1st, 2016 and tabled in the Legislative Assembly on November 3rd, 2016. Uh, the consolidated public accounts of the government were completed within the legislative timeframes of December 31st. Um, they received a clean audit opinion. Uh, the financial statements were signed on November 14, 2016 by the Minister of Finance, uh, myself, Controller General, and the Auditor General of Canada, and then provided to committee on January 27, 2017, and tabled in the Legislative Assembly on February, February 6, 2017. Um, the financial statements were signed on the 14th, provided to committee on the 27th. Um, in between, there was still work to be done on the financial financial statement discussion and analysis, including some new, new disclosures, mostly related to fiscal responsibility policy. Uh, slide four goes through some of the challenges we, we faced during the 2015-16 year. Um, one key challenge was around um, accounting for public-private partnerships. Um, you know, these, these new agreements with uh, around the Standard Territorial Hospital and Mackenzie Valley Fiber Link were quite, quite large and quite complex. Um, you know, we needed uh, need to go through them in quite detail and uh, work with our colleagues at the Office of the Auditor General. Um, so it took uh, excessive time on for uh, my staff as well as the Auditor General staff to work through those challenges. Um, at the end of the day, everything was re recorded correctly. It just took some, took some additional work and effort to get there. Um, as part of our work plan for the next fiscal year for the 16-17, um, my staff as well as the Auditor General staff and uh, the folks in the government in charge of the P3 projects have been working more closely together and aligned so that uh, um, all the information is being shared at the same time between uh, my staff as well as the Auditor General staff so we can uh, tackle key issues as they arise. Uh, another key challenge for us was around the actuarial ana analysis. Um, we, we have to hire an actuary. This is quite a complex calculation. So each year we have to hire a, an actuary to do this, to do this calculation. Um, last year we had a new actuary uh, for the 15, 16 years. So they had to re, reassess all the assumptions and evaluation of the prior year to get to the, get to the opening numbers in line with the, the same assumptions of this actuary. Um, the good news is going forward, we have the same actuary going forward, so there won't be that reassessment process. So, and we've also engaged the officer or the other general uh, as well as our staff. And, Everyone seems to be on the same page going forward to hopefully mitigate that, that challenge going forward. Uh, slide five, moving to the recommendations from this committee on the 14-15 public accounts. Um, the standing committee tabled a report on November 1st, which included about eight recommendations for consideration. Uh, the Minister of Finance tabled a response to the committee's recommendations on March 1st, 2017. Um, and overall, there was a, I think there was a positive move into addressing many of the committee's recommendations. So the following slides will reference uh, our view of uh, the Minister of Finance's response, including the actions taken. Uh, on slide six, uh, recommendation number one is provide the interim public accounts by August 31st of each year in time for a committee's review of the government's, government's business plans, which typically under, occurs in September of each year. Um, the Minister of Finance is committed to providing those interim public accounts by by August 31st of each year, noting we are on September 1st this year, just one day late with the interims. Um, um, but the Minister of Finance is committed to that, and you know, myself and my staff have uh, you know taken the action to ensure that uh, we get them to committee by August 31st of each year. Um, recommendation number two. Uh, continue to work closely with the Auditor General of Canada, government departments, boards and agencies to ensure that the audited public accounts are prepared as soon as possible and within statutory requirements. Um, so we continue close working relationships with our departments, boards and agencies uh, on a regular basis. Uh, that's something we, we, we do annually and we do throughout the year. Um, you know, the boards and agencies and departments face capacity issues, as do we, so we work, we're constantly working with them to to meet those statutory requirements, which we're able to do every year, and make sure uh, departments, boards, and agencies are able to meet, uh, meet their statutory requirements as well. 
Uh, slide seven, uh, recommendation number three. Um, include a list of all deadlines and completion dates for departments, boards, and agencies. Um, so some action was taken on this. So the above information around deadlines and completion dates and submission dates uh, for boards and agencies have been included in the financial statement discussion and analysis as part of the consolidated public accounts on page 36. Recommendation number four, provide updated timetables or schedules for the environmental assessment to be included annually in the public accounts. Um, the schedule in the public accounts has not changed. Uh, the schedules in the public accounts must continue to be, in a, be completed in accordance with uh, public sector reporting standards. Um, however, the Department of Finance is now posting a list of all sites that currently form part of the environmental liability disclosure on the government website. Our intent is to do that going forward uh, with a list of sites that reconciles to the March 31st statements of each fiscal year. Uh, the published environmental liabilities list contains only those sites, currently reflects only those sites reflected in the non-consolidated public accounts, so the, the core government. Uh, the data available is, is limited in that all details and cost estimates have not been released. The values assigned in the public accounts are estimates for accounting purposes only. There are not budgets associated with each site. Um, it would premature possibly pre-justice the, the future tenders if additional information was released as there often remains significant internal planning to be done related to the cleanup of this site. Uh, this, so this is a starting base. Uh, um, our, our office has worked with uh, many other departments to come up with uh, uh, what we think is a, a safe amount of disclosure that could be released to the public. So the amount information on the website is uh, the, first, the first step at that. Uh, slide eight. Um, recommendation number five, on a non-consolidated basis, also report on the performance measures related to the policy provisions of the fiscal responsibility policy on infrastructure financing and affordable debt. Uh, so disclosure relating to this recommendation has been included in the March 31st, 2016 financial statement discussion and analysis on page 35 of the consolidated statements. This includes the disclosure on how the GNRT met the policies, performance measures related to infrastructure, financing, and affordable debt. Um, recommendation number six, uh, develop plain language materials that report on public accounts in a manner that is understandable for an interested non-professional reader. So a plain language uh, type document has been done in both French and English. Um, the objective of this document is to help users and understand how to read, read the public accounts. Uh, this is, our, again, it's a, it's a new document, um, just recently done and finished and published uh, about a month ago. Um, so this is the initial take on how we can assist readers with the public accounts interpretation. Um, it avoids any numbers or, or technical, technical language. Um, the second you try to, try to put calculations or numbers, we, we found it very, very difficult to not have to include technical definitions or explain the technical calculations. So, we kept it fairly simple to, to walk, a, walk a person through what they're seeing in, a, in the financial statements and able to put some context to it in a, what we feel is a, is a plain language format. Um, again, we're open to, open to any recommendations on this. This is the first year of it, and uh, we'd like to progress that document as, as we go forward. Uh, recommendation number seven, slide number nine, um, amend the non-consolidated schedule of bad debt write-offs, forgiveness, and student loan remissions to protect the privacy of individuals by removing the names of those who have received student loan remissions and report only the amount of the remissions. Um, in the 1516 public accounts, we have not taken any action on that recommendation. Um, we feel that in accordance with the Financial Administration Act, uh, we need to ensure the transparency around these amounts to the public. Um, FAA section 65 uh, states that uh, any write-off, any forgiveness, and any remission needs to be disclosed in the public accounts. Um, in the past, in the past, you would have seen all remission, forgiveness, as well as uh, any write-off in their own standalone, standalone legislation. In, in quite detail, it would have went through. Um, every name, every amount in those, le in those pieces of legislation. The revised FA, which just went into force April 1st, 2016, um, doesn't recall for those acts, but it does recall for that type of information to be disclosed in the public accounts or the, or the financial statements of a, 
of a public agency. So we're currently not seeing that as a privacy breach. Um, we feel we need to follow the Financial Administration Act and ensure transparency around the forgiveness and remission of public money. Uh, slide 10, moving into some of the financial highlights of the 2015-16 year. Um, financial assets increased to 505 million from 490 million. The most significant change here was an increase in due from the Government of Canada as well as accounts receivable. Um, liabilities increased to 1.4 billion from 1.3 billion. The most notable increases were due to Government of Canada, long-term debt and short-term loans. Net debt increased to 883 million from 777 million. This increase is primarily due to the increase in the long-term debt with the inclusion of public-private partnerships for work done on the Stanton Territorial Hospital and the Kenzie Valley Fiber Link projects. The accumulated surplus increased to 2 billion from 1.9 billion. The accumulated surplus is the difference between non-financial assets and net debt and its changes are a direct result of any operating surplus or deficit. Actual revenues were less than budgeted by 39 million or 1.9%. Actual revenues decreased 3 million or 0.1% over the previous year. Corporate income tax, non-renewable resource revenue and sales contributed to this decrease. As well, actual expenses were less than budgeted by 15 million or 0.8%. These expenses also decreased 27 million or 1.4% over the previous year. On slide 11, just moving into the 2016-17 GMP public accounts. Um, so we need to analyze the impact of any new accounting standards, significant events, significant agreements, and government reorganizations on our consolidated financial statements as they become known. Um, we're currently not aware of any new accounting, accounting standard changes that will impact the 2017 audit of the government public accounts. Um, we also look to address some of the challenges that we learned from the 15-16 year and uh, work with our uh, OAG counterparts on those issues so we can, we can uh, mitigate those to begin this, this audit. And also, also working with the committee on addressing any concerns and recommendations as appropriate. So the 2017 audit is already underway. We're currently planning with our, our colleagues at the uh, Office of the Auditor General for, for some time since the end of January. And uh, work, is, uh, work is progressing. Um, last slide 12, so included on the, on the table and uh, in your packages is uh, a few pages on some key financial highlights as well as the um, plain language public accounts. I won't go through them right now, but if commission, committee wishes, we, we can go through them in, in any level of detail that committee wishes. So that concludes my presentation, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kui. Uh, one of the um, priorities for this committee is uh, um, ensuring that our government remains focused on uh, services to the public and on uh, uh, ensuring that we have documents um, that are readable and uh, understandable um, to, to Northerners. And we're, the uh, committee is very pleased to see the creation of this uh, public accounts guide. And uh, uh, given that we, we do have an audience here, we'd appreciate if you could walk us through what you've prepared here and uh, uh, just ex explain uh, the what the average reader can expect to find from this document. Yep, Mr. Gooey. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is a new account, and we've titled it uh, the Public Accounts and Overview. So again, the intent is in a, in a plain language type of way. Um, if a reader was to take this document, um, accompany with the financial statement, they'll be able to, to kind of see just a, a broad overview of what, their, what the numbers mean on each page. Um, so if you turn to the, the first page of the pamphlet, um, the public accounts overview kind of lays it out, um, you know, what the public accounts are, why, why they're needed. They're, they're needed in accordance with the Financial Administration Act, um, showing financial statements and the financial results of a government for a fiscal year. It also talks about the, the sections we have. So we have four sections to our public accounts. We have uh, Section 1, which is our, our consolidated public accounts, so it's GNWT, the core GNWT plus all the public agencies under our control. Um, section two is the non-consolidated financial accounts, so you're talking about just uh, government departments. 
And then there's some um, much, much, much thicker ones about all the financial statements of all the boards. And Section 4 concludes financial statements of all other consolidated entities. You know, those, are, those are posted online. Those are very significant documents. Uh, up to yay big, this, this speaks through it. Um, if you go on to page two, there's kind of a, a pictograph here um, of the, the public accounts exercise. So, you know, beginning with the, with the main estimates as the, the core document reflecting spending choices made by a government to advance their objectives and commitments, um, which includes the anticip anticipated revenues and planned spending. Um, from there, you have your main estimates, you have your, your, your budget, uh, the public accounts lays out the actual financial activities and financial positions for that fiscal year ended. Uh, going through it, uh, you have the officer, Office of the Controller General who's responsible for the public accounts as well as financial management and control systems in the government. Um, they're prepared by the Office of the Controller General, approved by the Minister of Finance, presented to the Legislative Assembly um, for review and over Standing Committee review and oversight of you know, why we're here today. Um, available to the public and audited annually by the Office of the Auditor General of Canada. Uh, the next page on Section 1 just kind of tries to walk you through the consolidated financial statements, um, you know, including all GNDT controlled organizations. So you're talking departments, revolving funds, public agencies, and other related entities. An example of another related entity would be the uh, NWT um, Sport and Rec Council. Um, not a public agency, but they are consolidated into our financial statements as we're deemed to control them from a, an accounting perspective. Um, this kind of walks you through the financial activity and then kind of takes you to a very high level definition of net debt, net debt being equal to liabilities. Um, greater than financial assets, which the government is in a debt, debt position, as we, we are aware. Kind of speaks to Section 2, the non-consolidated financial statements, um, including only the GNWT departments. So this relates to the spending that's approved in the main estimates um, through the Appropriation Act annually. Um, the next page speaks to a little bit about the, the Financial Administration Act and kind of the layout of the public accounts. So Section 1, Consolidated Financial Statements, speaks to the layout, um, difference between net debt or net financial resource position if we were in such a state. Um, the next page goes into more about what the financial statement discussion and analysis is about. I think the key, th the key features there, there's, there's three indicators of a financial health of a government being sustainability, flexibility, and vulnerability. So if you, if you read through the financial statement discussion analysis, it, it uh, has information related to each of those indicators of, of financial health. Um, then it talks about the non-consolidated financial statements again, um, government proper, as well as the other schedules um, and all the financial statements. Um, then the document more goes into how to read the financial statements in the public accounts. So it talks about the, the statement of financial position, um, what that is in a, in a hopefully plain language as we could, we could make it at this time. Uh, on the next page you get into the, the statement of change in net debt, exactly what that is. Uh, moving on to the statement of operation, the statements of cash flow and notes and schedules. Um, a key, key area here to finish is kind of comparing the budget to the, to the public accounts. Um, you know, how, how the planning and the government actually lines up to what is reported in, in the public accounts. And it ends on a little bit of a, the debt and fiscal responsibility, um, just overall what the, what the territory borrowing limit is, um, what the fiscal responsibility policy is and why it's required, um, and a few key things around the fiscal responsibility policy. So again, it just kind of tries, attempts to Take a reader through what they're what they'd be seeing in the financial statements, and not uh, try not to get into any technical definitions or, or calculations, um, which is the in, intent of the document. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Cooley. Um, does any and uh, thank you for walking us through that that guide. I think it's a it's uh, a good first start. I'm sure we'll work together on on fine tuning it. Does anyone have any? Um, Questions or comments first about the plain language guide, Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I want to thank the department for uh, 
producing this document. Uh, this is my second year reviewing the public accounts. And uh, I understand them a little more now, but still, it's a 1,453-page document that you have to be an accountant to understand. And we were, uh, a lot of us were sort of at a loss at, at the first time around. And so this is a, uh, an important document, and I want to thank you for that. Um, and I guess that, as far as the plain language document goes, that's just a thank you. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see the floor. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Um, the, the one th does anyone else, any other committee members have comments on the, this document, the public accounts? No. Mr. O'Reilly? Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think this is a good start. Um, it could probably be even made a, a little bit plainer language in a few places, but uh, um, I know that the NWT Literacy Council uh, does have some plain language experts that uh, you can call upon to give you some advice and, and uh, uh, reviewing this again perhaps to, but it, it, the graphics in here are really good and uh, I would encourage that, uh, uh, you know, I guess the public accounts probably have a, a, a certain way of uh, being presented and formatted and so on, but it would be great if this could actually be put in the front of the, the document itself for someone who just downloads it off the internet or sees it, then they have a bit of a guide to uh, help them. Uh, understand uh, the formatting, the presentation of the information and, and what to look for. So a uh, very good start and uh, appreciate the efforts of the uh, Comptroller General and his uh, staff to put that together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Um, the, the one comment I'll, I'll make that, that this, uh, this certainly is, is helpful, uh, but it's more of a, a user's guide um, to the public accounts. Um, one thing I think that, that would be helpful, you've prepared this uh, 2016 Public Accounts Highlights document, and the uh, committee is familiar with, with w what you've included here, uh, but perhaps this could be prepared um, uh, in a plain language summary as a public document, along with this kind of companion piece. So what's contained in these thousand or so pages is uh, summarized very succinctly in, in, a, in a handful of pages. Um, I think this is still a very important document, but if, if each time the public accounts are prepared, something along these lines could be provided to the public, that's, um, I think, where committee's head was at uh, initially, although this is definitely helpful to people who want to dig through this without the technical training that uh, uh, professional accountancy affords them. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Koo, if you'd like to comment on any of those uh, those uh, comments we shared with you. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, great comments, and uh, you know, taking you through where we were, we we did have this document, and we did we did have some of the financial highlights within it. Um, we ended up taking them out, back in, and then we ended up taking them out as as we evolved through ourselves. So I mean, and I appreciate the members' comments around technical. Um, you know, we're accountants and we're writing this document. We did engage um, overall corporate communications and we did engage um, um, the parties and planning uh, office in the executive who works with the Minister of uh, uh, Transparency and Public Engagement's office in this. Um, so it was kind of evolving back and forth as they took out some of our uh, more technical language. Um, yeah, you appreciate that. And uh, again, you know, appreciate the members' comments around. Uh, the financial highlights because we did we did struggle with that again they were in and out so I uh, appreciate to see what what committees think into to what we're thinking and what we produced and again we we look forward to evolving them in the future to to meet the needs of our residents thank you mr. chair thank you mr. Cooney keep up the good work and uh, now we'll turn to general comments related to both the presentation and the public accounts mr. Simpson thank you mr. chair and uh, again I want to congratulate or thank the, uh, the, your office for preparing these accounts. You, you noted that it was a day late that uh, the, the public accounts were submitted, but in the past uh, it had been, I think, up to a year late. The, this committee hadn't even reviewed them for a while because you'd be looking back years in the past. And so uh, your office has uh, made great strides with that. It would really amaze someone from the 16th Assembly who would basically throw their hands up in frustration with these public accounts. Uh, that being said, um, I want to ask, we are a small government, and so in a lot of areas we have a, a lack of depth. And that doesn't mean that the, the people in the positions aren't good, but there might be no one backing them up. There might not be, if they're gone for two weeks, then nothing is getting done. And so I was wondering, do you think that uh, there are sufficient accountants in the GNWT in place to handle this workload? Uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Mr. 
Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Cooey? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, the members' questions, it's, it's a challenge for us. Um, we are, you know, all our government departments and public agencies do have their, their capacity issues. Um, to answer your specific question, I do think there is a, there's enough accountants in the government and the public agencies. This is a matter of uh, competing priorities. Um, you know, th these are highly educated people. A lot falls on their plate. Um, I think members can appreciate the, the couple years that we're coming off of, of high, high planning, business planning, main estimates, business planning, main estimates. Um, I think now we're finally, finally through those, through that where these people can see, uh, get back to their, their regular routine. Um, but it, it does come pretty quick. Like we're here presenting on the 15 and 16 public accounts. Um, the 16, 17 year just ended, and the whole exercise just just started again. So some of the, some of the things we work with our, our departments of public agencies on is that we're very clear. We've issued a document uh, some number of months ago with the key the key dates that are going to be due from started in March already to the end of June. I think is when it when it typically ends. So. There's key schedules as we produce, go through each account and whatnot um, that they need to produce. So they're very aware of that. And it's about me working with my counterparts to, to make sure that those dates are aware and the message is clear to try and try and organize your staff's holidays as best you can. Um, you get into a busy time with March break and into summer and whatnot, it's hard. It's a, definitely a challenge for us, but the dates are out there and it's very clear to them that they're expected to meet those dates. And uh, if not, um, there's uh, escalation processes through to uh, from my staff up to myself uh, or above me to uh, to uh, make the calls when we need to to make sure that those dates are being hidden and uh, reported on, so so people are accountable for it in the department or public agency. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooey, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. And I know one of the, uh, the issues with this government is that you may have a good person in place, and they might leave, and you might have to bring someone else in and they might not have that sort of corporate knowledge. And so one of the things I always like to, to talk about is having people from the north working in the government in certain positions that are hard to recruit, say, in accounting. And I always use the example, when I went to school, I was taking a professional degree, and uh, I was almost disappointed that no one from the government, the Department of Justice, because I was uh, taking a law degree, reached out and said, you know, we have a summer student position for you. We want to bring you back. We want to show you that this is a place you want to work, because I'm invested in the north. I was coming back to the north. And so if we can reach out to students and uh, tell them that you know, the Department of Finance has a place for you if you're getting your accounting designation. I think it would help to sort of uh, stabilize you know, some of the issues that we have with, uh, with our, our depth issues and our, our capacity issues. So is, and you have a good overview of uh, the, the, the capabilities of all the departments and agencies you know, uh, preparing these public accounts. So is your department doing anything to reach out to uh, students, accounting students, and try and bring them into the uh, GNWT? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Simpson, Mr. Cooley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I appreciate the member's comments. Um, yeah, he's correct in uh, you know trying to train Northerners for these these harder to recruit jobs and people that uh, that know the business or know the business of the government is, is much easier when you get down to the transaction level and recording for those activities. Um, so, so one thing we're doing and. As this territory moves towards the new one one professional designation for accountants, currently currently we have three and transitioning to um, to the certified professional accountant designation. And I know there'll be a, a legislative proposal and whatnot coming forward at some point. Um, but moving to that one one designation makes it a little easier for us to to recruit. Um, now that they're, we're, they're all under one board, not not three different boards, so all your professional accounting and students would be under under the one board. So it makes it easier for us to, to target those students. So one thing we're, we're, we're working on is uh, kind of our guidelines on, on how to attract those students to, to work, um, how, to, how to say within the overall human resource policy guidelines that what we will, how we will support them to go through the program while they work full time with the government to get that, to get that valued uh, work experience and get their education at the same time. So we're, we're working on those guidelines to kind of target those students, and I know uh, the Department of Finance is really, really ramping up and looking for summer students and interns to, uh, that are interested in the accounting field. And so, you know, we kind of see the Department of Finance as a, as a good, if you want to call it a breeding ground, where we, we could bring them in, teach them about accounting, teach them about internal controls, and then um, get them out to, to department and program land to, to share their knowledge out there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Mr. Cooey. Uh, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Cooey, for your uh, presentation here. I was particularly uh, impressed on some of the challenges and, and, and the uh, face challenges that you, you went through when the previous assembly or this government in general has taken on additional responsibilities such as devolution, for example, um, P3 projects. As you know, uh, you had mentioned your learning and, and, and accounting for two of them currently, and there's a third one that this assembly has uh, approved with Wati Road. So I, I'm glad to hear that uh, moving forward, these challenges that were minimized and faced with an approach for further P3 projects. So I, I, I'm glad to, glad to hear that. And my question is related on the uh, TFF formula negotiations and, uh, and if we can expect, I would say, increases in the formula as you, as you know, this government uh, has many, many challenges operating and representing a lot of communities that are isolated and just operating on a seasonal basis <clears throat> through winter road access, for example, for mobilization for goods and services. And uh, nothing ever goes down at all. It, it just seems like groceries, for example, and gasoline and petroleum products always end up going up. And uh, is there any way that we can look forward to further negotiations with the federal government on increasing our formula funding to go up as well as inflationary uh, inflationary costs come to face our, our small remote communities? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Mr. Cooey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first off, addressing the, the comments around the, the public-private partnerships. Um, Again, those are those are very, very large, complex agreements, and uh, you know we're fortunate enough to uh, have a good working relationship with the Officer of Auditor General to to work through those issues uh, collaboratively. So we ensure we 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 record those transactions right, which which we ended up doing in the 15, 16 year. It just took some time. Um, as for the the formal financing agreement, um, you know, that's a that's an agreement that's uh, negotiated. Uh, you know, through the, the Deputy Minister, I mean, through the Minister of Finance um, with the fiscal policy staff, staff not uh, not in the uh, accounting for it in the public accounts or the Office of the Comptroller General area, so I can't comment on the, those future negotiations. I'm just not involved in them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooey. Mr. McNeely? Um, nothing further at this point there, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Mr. Simpson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the world's moving away from paper, and uh, every, virtually everything is on computers now. And I know the Department of Finance, like everyone, is moving in that direction as well with the GNWT's financial management system. Uh, the, the design of these systems are important because if they're designed with the proper controls, they can reduce the risk of uh, misstatements, which uh, could affect uh, fiscal decisions that uh, decision makers make. And uh, they also can uh, identify and de deter any potential fraud. Uh, I know, you know, again, we're a, we're a small government, and I so we may be behind some of the provinces in, in terms of this. So is there a plan moving forward as far as the, uh, the financial management system uh, that we have in place? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Cooey? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so yeah, we're currently on the PeopleSoft uh, financial financial management system um, system for sustainability and management. Um, we've invested a lot of a lot of money in that system, along with our uh, PeopleSoft counterpart, uh, Human Resource Information System. Um, we're currently going through uh, a major upgrade of those systems. From I think it's from versions 9.2 and 9.1 to version 9.2, which will bring us in. Uh, Full compliance and fully, fully uh, supported through the, uh, the year 2024, I do believe. Um, you know, part of that upgrade is really looking at uh, looking at the security and as well as internal controls. Um, part of the balance we find, and there's a lot of other jurisdictions I, I do believe that are on the or moving to the same same platform 9.2 that that we are doing currently doing right now. Um, part of that work is um, trying to find that balance um, between. Customizing your system with uh, with an internal control or, or doing your internal control through uh, 
uh, through a business process. Um, at the same time, we think we're about uh, on year five of our implementation to our financial shared services where, where we where we have grouped all the financial processing and we have a lot of uh, a lot of now corporate knowledge and a lot of uh, a lot of qualified people working in the same f finance unit um, developing more strong internal controls within the office of the controller general um, rather than standalone shops in each department so um, we are trying to find the balance in the upgrade of what you can customize. The issue with customizing your system is uh, if, if something breaks, it's hard for the support, support in PeopleSoft to help fix that because we've overridden something the system's designed to do, um, to doing that in business process. Um, so we are we are taking a look at it. We are working with the Office of the Auditor General, who's uh, issued some some guidance. So well, Ms. Emily and, and and her staff are are going through some uh, some of the issues to make sure our internal controls are are strong where where they 100% need to be. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cooey, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that, that was actually my second question: is uh, it's the Office of the Auditor General of Canada who audits the uh, public accounts. So uh, what sort of consultation is there? with them on the development of the system. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cooey? Ask Ms. Emelian to provide some detail on that consultation. Thank you, Ms. Emelian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as Mr. Cooey just mentioned, uh, um, our office is currently reviewing um, the recommendations, the IT recommendations that the Office of the Auditor General had previously given us from the 2016 fiscal year's audit, and we're hoping to in incorporate that into our current upgrade, upgrade project. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I guess I'd like to start with the uh, recommendation that the committee made last year about uh, um, privacy of individuals who have their student loan uh, remissions listed in the uh, non-consolidated financial statements. There's uh, Schedule 9. There's four pages of individuals listed with the amounts that where their loan remissions vary from about $300 to $10,000. And the, the total amount is actually less than $1 million. Um, you know, these people, I'm sure, did not consent to the release of this information. And uh, um, it's not through some fault or act of their own. This is government policy. We want our students to come back here. We want them to uh, work here. And because they've come and done that, they end up on this list. It's not like this is bad debt. It's not in the same category as uh, bad debt or write-offs. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, through our student financial assistance program. So um, I'm just wondering, um, can we find a way to consolidate this information, provide the number of students, the totals, without releasing the, the individual names and the amounts? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly, and that is uh, page, pages 59 to 63 of the uh, non-consolidated financial statements. Uh, Mr. Cooey, if you will answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I mean, currently, you know, we're, we're looking at it. Um, currently, we think we're following the, the Financial Administration Act in, in, uh, in disclosing um, any remission. So we're talking about the students, student loans, which is a remission. So we're talking about... Um, following Section 65 of the Financial Administration Act and disclosing any remission. So um, take the members' comments and take the members' points around whether we could uh, summarize that at a higher level and not include the names. Um, we'd, have to, we'd have to take a look at it and work with our counterparts at, uh, counterparts at uh, education to, to see what uh, departments are, what the students are signing off on, if they're just signing off on disclosure in their agreements or, or not. But uh, something we can certainly take a look at. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooey. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the response. Uh, I would also suggest that you talk to the uh, um, Access to Information and Privacy Commissioner about this practice as well. In my reading of the Act, look, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't believe it requires the disclosure of the individual names and amounts that it could be consolidated. This is not bad debt. This is uh, a loan remission. It, it's very different than some of the other information that's presented in that, that schedule, but I'll leave it for that now. And I would ask if the Controller General could uh, commit to consult with the Access to Information and Privacy Commissioner in undertaking the review of whether we need to disclose all of that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cooey? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I can commit to, uh, 
uh, contacting the Access to Information and Privacy Commissioner to have an independent review of uh, to see if we are uh, at any breach with uh, disclosing that information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooey. Appreciate it. Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In your opening remarks, you mentioned that the GNWT needs to practice financial or practice careful fiscal management. Um, I see that uh, Section 2 of the non-consolidated financial statement says the Schedule 7, which is the non-consolidated schedule of special warrants. Uh, I was wondering, because this is a public review, and just so if you could inform the public what the special warrants, what exactly they are. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Cooey? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, yeah, a special warrant is um, it's an emergency way to uh, – to get an appropriation when the Legislative Assembly is not, not sitting in session. So I think there's there's two areas in the Financial Administration Act that speak to when a, when a special warrant can be issued. Um, so the first would be when the, the first is when the Legislative Assembly is not sitting for, for any time in the near future and there's a certain criteria that needs to be met for, for, uh, for a special warrant such as uh, the expenditure is urgently required. Um, um, uh, these types of things. So there's certain criteria that need to be met and the Commissioner can on the recommendation of the Financial Management Board issue a special warrant. Um, so basically you're talking about an example would be um, forest fires. Um, so you would see a lot of uh, special warrants around forest fires. I think those are in the previous couple, few fiscal years, those are the only special warrants that have been issued. Um, the Department needs the appropriation to incur, incur the expenditures to go fight those fires. Um, so they can't wait for the Legislative Assembly to, to approve a supplementary appropriation. Um, so in such instances of those emergencies, then a special warrant can be issued by the Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooey. And I'll note that in the public accounts, the current public accounts, uh, there are two special warrants indicated. One is uh, a special warrant for force, uh, fighting forest fires in the amount of 20 million nine hundred and. Uh, 20908000 and the other was uh, the purchase of um, mineral claims and mineral leases for the Mac Tung Tungsten pro property, the amount of uh, 4500000 Mr. Simpson? Oh, sorry. Uh, page 53, I believe. 54, sorry. Page 54. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Okay, Mr. Simpson, you may continue with your line of uh, questions and comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that just, uh, this is a public service. I wanted to get that out there, that these are amounts that aren't voted on by the Legislative Assembly. These are, uh, I, I guess it's uh, FMB, which is essentially Cabinet unilaterally making a decision to spend this money. Um, I guess that was it. I was just going to, uh, to mention that just to let, let people know how things work. So that's it for now. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that public service, Mr. Simpson. We'll now return to Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm looking at page uh, 31 of the uh, Consolidated Financial Statements, and this is where uh, receivables and payables to the Government of Canada are found. And uh, there was quite an increase, about 70%, from 2015 to 2016 uh, in terms of uh, receivables from the uh, Government of Canada. So that's money that we uh, are trying to get back from the Government of Canada, probably under a variety of arrangements. And uh, I, I know that at, at the bottom, though, when you look at receivables and payables, it's not really a huge difference between 2015 and 2016. It's only about $3 million difference. But there was a big increase in terms of the receivables um, due to us uh, over $30 million. So. I'm just wondering, is that a result of us not getting uh, invoices in on time, or is it the federal government slow in paying uh, uh, the, the government of the Northwest Territories for projects or things that we're doing? And the reason why I ask this is because uh, if we can get this, if, if there's an issue there and we we, uh, we can sort it out in any way and, and get the, the, the money to us quicker, then it gives us a better um, bottom uh, line at the end uh, in terms of cash at the end of uh, the financial year. So I'm um, just wondering if Mr. Cooey can give us some insight into these this change in figures. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cooey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what, we, what we 
what our, our office tends to see is uh, near the end of the fiscal year, there's a large amount of these agreements come to come to fruition and get signed. Um, what we noticed at the end of last year was there was a more significant number of these agreements um, signed and, and sealed and recorded near the end of the year. Um, there was, as a member noted, there was a $27 million increase in the miscellaneous receivables um, from 2015-2016. The most notable of that would be um, the Inubik Tuck Highway, which would be a large receivable that was that was due at the end of end of 2016. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooey. Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I have a number of questions about the uh, um, environmental liabilities uh, schedule, which is uh, our note. It's number 11 on page 22 of the non-consolidated financial statements. I'll just go ahead uh, and You start. may proceed, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So uh, in the uh, note and uh, in the presentation as well, um, our con controller general mentioned that there's now a, uh, uh, a list of the contaminated sites found on the Department of Finance website. I was able to find it and uh, have a very quick look at it. Um, it's rather, um, there's 191 sites that we have uh, uh, and 74 though there's no liability recorded because it says here that there's, uh, they're not likely to affect public health, safety, cause damage, or otherwise impair the quality of the surrounding environment. So can, um, can we just get a little bit more insight into why uh, over a third of the sites there is no liability uh, um, required, or sorry, uh, included in our financial statements, our public accounts? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cooey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll ask Ms. Emily to respond. Thank you. Mr. Kui, Ms. Emily. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to provide some background on, on how or uh, why we accounted for things this way, we're following uh, an accounting standard, um, accounting standard 3260 with the accounting handbook for public sector. And with it, it splits up environmental liabilities between two sections, operating versus non-operating sites. So with regards to non-operating sites, we're required to set up an environmental liability for full remediation costs um, for these particular sites. These 74 represent operating sites where no liability is required. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Emily and Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. So these 74 sites that continue to be operated, um, there's still going to be some liability at the end of the day when, when they're no longer operating. So how do we account for closure, remediation uh, costs for those sites, uh, although they continue to operate, uh, you know, whether it's a landfill uh, uh, that we may have some responsibility for or an airport or something, at some point somebody's going to have to do some remediation on that site, whether we include it now in the operating costs or not. So. Uh, those costs are just not calculated or included in any way right now. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Ms. Emily. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That is correct. However, we are constantly monitoring all these sites, despite them not having a value attached them to fully remediate them. Um, some monitoring uh, wells have been installed at some sites, for example, just so that we can uh, keep abreast of whether or not um, the environmental liability right now um, would pass environmental standards and then would um, constitute some reaction on our end in terms of remediating the site itself. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, the, um, I, I understand uh, not all these sites, though, may be uh, regulated in some way by, uh, say, the land and water boards or whatever, and uh, I just think that it would be good environmental practice and good accounting practice to uh, ensure that we have the funds available to remediate the sites whenever they close. But that, maybe that's, a, that's more of an accounting uh, standards uh, discussion at some point. Um, I just want to turn to the inventory, if I can, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm looking at the, the federal contaminated sites uh, uh, inventory. It's a very extensive one. There's over almost 20, there's over 23,000 sites listed in their inventory at the federal level. For the Northwest Territories, they have uh, 1,658 sites identified. And if you go in and you look at those individual sites, 
there's a remarkable amount of information about each of those sites, including how much has been spent year by year over about the last 15, 20 years. So you can see exactly how much has been spent, what the contaminated, contamination issues are, the precise location, down to lot numbers and street numbers and so on for each of these sites. Uh, the inventory that we've got started uh, is fairly broad to say the least. It has a general uh, uh, identification of the, the location, the, the site name, and sort of the phase of remediation. And um, I understand that we don't want to disclose too much information because we may have to contract for remediation services at some point for some of those sites. But can we move a little bit more towards what the, the federal government has where you can at least see how much has been spent on each of those sites? And this is all publicly available. So I'm just wondering if, and our inventory only includes the departmental ones, not the uh, other entities like uh, NT uh, Power Corporation or the, the Hydro uh, uh, Corporation or the Housing Corp. Uh, 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 sort of arm's length entity. So can we, may, look, great that we've got an inventory up on the website, but I think it only contains about 60 sites or something. Can we move much more towards what the federal government has done in terms of transparency and openness and disclosure? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Mr. Cooey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, we, we can, this was just a starting base, uh, as I mentioned in, in the presentation that uh, we did work with uh, numerous departments. Uh, I think we were working with uh, land, ENR, Public Works, um, majority of the, the main infrastructure departments uh, to come up with a, to come up with a level of disclosure. Uh, we knew this was a starting point. It was a, it was a good place to start. Uh, it was what, uh, what the government felt comfortable in disclosing. Um, with respect to the, the 60 sites, I know we did, we did group the landfills, we did group uh, the, the lagoons into those and just said various communities. So I know there's probably 20 or 30 of them grouped into, into one line on our website rather than disclosing them. Um, I know there, there is some concerns around disclosing certain sites in certain communities when we, you know, when we get to small communities that uh, are uh, trouble with property values as it is. Um, if we do disclose a, a level of uh, environmental liability on a certain site in a community, there's concerns about uh, affecting the, the property value of those. So there are, are some concerns that we're working through, but um, um, absolutely I can commit to, to taking a look at the, the, the federal listing and uh, seeing if we can evolve ours to include uh, more information as, as we progress through disclosing this information publicly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cooey and Mr. Riley, if you can conclude this line of question. Sure, appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the uh, one last question about this: we, There's a tremendous number of sites that are being uh, reviewed and evaluated through the devolution uh, agreement and process. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, how are the, you folks are probably involved or paying attention to that? And uh, um, can we expect that there's going to be a number of additional sites that are going to show up here in the future, depending on how that process uh, uh, plays out? Uh, or can you tell us sort of where we're at with that process? There, there's a f deadline, I think, about April 1st, 2019, by which um, determination is supposed to be made on literally hundreds or thousands of sites uh, uh, that are listed in the devolution agreement. So where are we at with that? that process. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Ms. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know we were working with our uh, the Environmental Liabilities Working Group, um, and I know we're, we're working closely with the Department of uh, uh, Environment and Natural Resources, um, who are, has developed a plan to to look at all the sites prior to the closing. I know they have a, we have a that five-year window under the devolution agreement. I know they've listed all the sites. Uh, they've come to talk to us um, in this most current fiscal year, 16, 17, that just closed about uh, a plan to <coughs> a plan to get out there and assess all those sites. And then, um, you know, once they once they get out there to do their assessments, then it's a matter of bringing it back to to what. Uh, the negotiations with Canada to see who's responsible for the ultimate cleanup. So I know ENR does have a plan in place to do the work so we can assess those sites prior to the five-year window closing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooley. Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I understand that the GNWT <coughs> 
is given what's called a management letter by the Office of the Auditor General after uh, that office completes an audit of the public accounts. And it's my understanding that these management letters include uh, issues that the OAG ran into or concerns they have. From our, this committee's meetings with the Office of the Auditor General, it appears that uh, your two offices have a great working relationship. And as they, as they run into issues, uh, they bring it up and your office uh, works to, uh, to fix those problems in real time. So I was wondering, what exactly is in these uh, management letters? Are there recurring issues that uh, the OAG has been bringing to your attention for years that uh, just can't seem to get fixed? And how is the department dealing with those if they do exist? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cooney? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We will ask Ms. Emeline to respond. Ms. Emeline. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, over the past three years, uh, no, they're not ha they have not been recurring um, management letter points from the Office of the Auditor General. Um, we work very closely with the Office of the Auditor General, and we actually discuss some of those points before they're, at, they're presented formally. So we actually action a lot of those items ahead of time. Um, as part of our planning for the next fiscal year, we also discuss um, whether those issues have been, um, um, I guess, discussed or, or have we dealt with them or whether or not they're expecting that there will be the same issue in the, the next fiscal year, which has not been the case to date. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, as a committee, we've never seen these letters, so I was just wondering, uh, would, the, uh, would your office be willing to share uh, management letters uh, with this committee just so we can get a look at it and see what's in there? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Curry? Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as far as I know, the, the letters haven't been provided to committee in the past, but uh, I can commit to uh, talking with our colleagues at the Office of the Auditor General and uh, see if we can uh, come to a plan to, to share those or not and get back to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooey. Mr. Simpson, anything further? Um, nothing further than that line. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to add a little uh, in my own language to on the contaminated sites there. My colleague had mentioned here earlier. Uh, th this government, as we know, is being proactive in land management, stewardship, and so on, having finalized devolution in terms of conditions within the agreement of the transfer of responsibilities of this government. And we're, we're only as good as managers as the work we do in, in, uh, in securing and in cleaning up and monitoring our activities out on the land. So we've got a bunch of sites out there that could create a great wealth of opportunities to clean up somebody else's mess as, as per the agreement. Now, if we keep dragging it on to the deadline of April the 1st, 2019, without being proactive in seeking, and that probably should be done now, an extension to that deadline to assume the responsibilities of these clean sites, as well as the uh, responsibilities underneath the Resource Management Act. And I, I just see a, a great wealth of opportunity in both portfolios to, uh, to, to this government in being proactive. And I, I know the land management activity and remediation, reclamation, and so on is, is really not with, with your department, but in the accounting side of, <clears throat> of these lands after they're reclaimed and the waiver of liabilities is done, could be brought from your office to the attention of the appropriate department, in this case ENR, to say, listen, if you really want these 74 sites, I would get on it if I were you to encourage the feds to acknowledge the terms and conditions of the devolution agreement so we can enter that as a capitalization on, on clean lands as negotiated within the devolution agreement. So I, I just bring that forward to uh, as a point of notice and uh, as you know what April the 1st 2019 is going to be fast approaching and all of a sudden it come that point we're going to say well we should have done this and we should have done that. Devolution was finalized three years ago and 
to our knowledge, not a lot of work has really been done to the responsibilities that we accumulated. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Mr. Cooley? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, uh, Agree with the with the members' comments, and I think what you'll what you'll find in the when we're reviewing the 16, 17 public accounts is that we've we've taken a fairly aggressive approach in working with uh, the Department of ENR, who's developed a plan to develop a plan to look at all those sites within the within the few years left remaining, um, and we've developed a plan to uh, where we've accrued an amount in the 16, 17 through our environmental liabilities, so they have the funding to undertake that work. Um, so they are not doing it off the side of their desk, but that is uh, just a very recent recent progress that's been made in the in the 16, 17 public accounts. But I agree, it is a priority, and we are treating it as a priority through through that process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooey. Mr. McNeely. Nothing further, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. McNeely. Um, anything further from committee? I have a, a few points then. Um, just on the uh, one, one of the areas of the Auditor General uh, found um, um, not of concern but of, of specific attention was the amalgamation of health boards. Um, uh, com and committee is, of course, aware of the the uh, creation of the NWT, this uh, single health authority. Uh, and uh, currently, there are, each authority uses different financial information. And uh, uh, we understand that the plan is to move to a single financial accounting system. Um, how is that transition um, performing? And uh, are there any concerns from, from the offices of the Comptroller General? Uh, vis-a-vis -vis this process gone ongoing into future years. Mr. Cooey? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we're heavily involved in that. Um, so right now we're currently working on a, on a business case for the new proposed one financial system. Um, and, you know, ideally, we can get them on the, on the same financial system. Um, so we are, we are looking at a business case to, to bring them to one financial system. Um, I think we'll be coming forward with, with something through or proposal through the 1819 capital plan planning process. Um, I think it's a, it's a matter of capacity, right? So I think they're doing work right now where they, where they are looking at, um, right now they're on so many different systems. So if they can do the work within the next couple of years to streamline their processes and bring their processes more, more aligned, um, that's step one. Step two would be to get on the same financial system. And then step three would be to, to, you know, interact with our financial system or get on our financial system. Um, but we are heavily involved in that. We are actively working on a business case with the Department of Health and with the uh, NVTHSSA on that business case. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, are there any concerns that the that process is going to delay the um, uh, the public accounts, the issuance of the public accounts moving forward, or uh, are these um, separate financial systems still able to report in the same way uh, that won't delay the, the the public accounts or accurate financial statements from the health from the single health authority, Mr. Cooey? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we've, we've come up with a plan with the interim. Um, we've talked to our colleagues at the uh, Office of the Auditor General who've, uh, who've also agreed to the plan. So um, while they're on their own financial systems, we are retaining their current, their current auditors for each separate organization who will audit each, each one's financial statements. Um, they will then be consolidated into the NTHSSA statements, which will be audited by the Office of the Control, uh, Auditor General. Um, so, you know, although it's not ideal, we have come up with an interim measure that uh, that is uh, that will work for us and shouldn't delay the public accounts going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Um, there, are, as, as, as we all know, there are some uh, major departmental or amalgamations that have been now approved with the, the, the most recent budget. Um, including the new Department of Infrastructure, the Department of Executive and Indigenous Affairs, and the new Department of Finance, which now includes the old Department of Human Resources. Are there any concerns about um, uh, new accounting? Um, are there any accounting concerns around these amalgamations that will um, impact the public accounts moving forward into future years? Mr. Cooey? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. There's no uh, accounting concerns. Um, there's capacity concerns uh, that my office shares, and we've we've talked to uh, 
talk to the shared corporate human resource folks. Um, we're, we're, we're working with the Department of Infrastructure to, to finalize, um, you know, they're moving forward with their one department, but they still need to report on the year end of two previous departments. So you'll still see the Department of Public Works and Services and the Department of Transportation in the 16-17 in the in the public accounts. So we're working with them on, on their plans on how they're going to process transactions going forward as well as close off on their on their previous year's uh, public accounts process. So we're actively working with them and uh, we're, we're quite confident they'll be able to pull it off without delaying the, delaying the public accounts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, on to the, uh, returning to the issue of uh, public pri public private partnerships or P3 agreements. Um, there's a, in the consolidated public accounts uh, under the financial discussion and narrative, there's a page for, uh, on page 35, there's the compliance with fiscal responsibility policy section. Now here uh, under P3 items that are out of scope of this policy, there's the Mackenzie Valley Fiber Link at 65 million and the Stanton Territory Hospital at 14 million. Um, that is the clearest statement of, of uh, P3 expenditures in the public accounts as, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, my understanding is a portion of that, of that cost is included under a future capital lease, uh, sorry, uh, under Schedule C of the non-consolidated <coughs> accounts relating to tangible capital assets. So my question is, is there a way to um, clearly uh, show these P3 obligations um, in the public accounts? Uh, because right now they're seemingly all over the place. Is there, a, is there a way we can better show our P3 obligations or account for P3 obligations uh, moving forward? Do you have any comments on that, Mr. Cooley? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I agree with the member. It's, um, it's not ideal, as you, as, you, as you referenced on Schedule C of the, or Schedule 4, the non-consolidated summary of capital acquisitions. It's the expenditures for the Mackenzie Valley Fiber Link and Stanton are, are quite buried within the Department of Finance or the Department of Health and Social Services. Um, we can definitely look at our disclosures going forward, whether we can, how we can disclose better around our, our P3 and P3 obligations in, in, our, in our public accounts, as I said right now. Um, that's something we can definitely commit to doing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cooley. I, I believe it's uh, in the interest of the public to clearly see what these projects, what these major infrastructure projects and P3 projects are, are, um, are booking, uh, so to speak. So um, I look forward to seeing a more clear and transparent process moving forward. Um, on to... Um, uh, back uh, in returning just to the the, F, the fiscal responsibility um, policy itself, as indicated, as listed on, on page five or sorry, 35, um, we have uh, a number of values uh, indicated here, and uh, not all of these uh, terms are consistent with what's contained in the public accounts. So uh, the committee it would would be very appreciative if we could receive um, a clear indication of where these numbers can be found within the body of the public accounts proper. Um, although we, um, we trust your analysis, we'd like to do our own analysis on our end. So can you commit to working with uh, the committee on a, a staff uh, or official level to provide that information clearly as to where we can find it so the committee can perform its own independent assessment if the government is in compliance with its fiscal responsibility policy? Mr. Cooley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we can commit to, to having our staff talk and uh, we can provide a, a technical on where, we're, where the numbers are pulling from um, and, and guide them to schedules uh, as needs to be. So. We can commit to that, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooey. Uh, the Auditor General of Canada staff uh, spent uh, approximately 6,237 hours on this audit, which is a considerable amount of work. Um, do you have a sense of what, our, what your office or the government's time was spent on com compiling this audit? Mr. Cooey? I don't know if I should, but I'll defer this one to uh, Ms. Emily Ann to respond. <laughs> Ms. Emily Ann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, don't have exact numbers, but we do start the process from middle of January till the end of September, October. Um, 
day in, day out. Uh, right now it's uh, for full-time staff as well during that entire process over the time period. Mr. Kui? I think Mr. Chair, yeah, just follow up on that. Uh, so, you know, we have four, four dedicated staff, you know, as well as our assistant controller general who, who he's in a lot and then departments have significant resources that go into their department year end. So uh, I can't even estimate a number for you, but the, the numbers are significant, um, you know, across the across all of government to, to get these done on time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Um, and we appreciate the, uh, the large amount of work that goes into compiling these documents. Uh, it's my understanding that there are uh, quarterly variance reports uh, leading up to the issuance of the public accounts. Uh, could, could committee receive these, these uh, quarterly reports as information items uh, to assist our review, our eventual review of the public accounts uh, on, uh, on a go-forward basis, Mr. Curry? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, c I can't make that commitment, but I can bring it forward to our department. I think uh, those quarterly variance reports currently go to the Financial Management Board, so I would have to build them. It would be a request to the Minister of Finance. Um, I could take that forward to my deputy as a request that was made, and, uh, and we can go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Cooley. I would uh, appreciate that. Um, and finally, um, uh, for me, there was a number of, uh, of questions around our environmental liabilities, and I and I am aware that the uh, the publicly available inventory differs from uh, the uh, the interdepartmental uh, inventory or, or document related to environmental liabilities. Um, can you commit to providing that environmental liabilities documentation to committee on a confidential <laughs> basis, Mr. Cooey? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I believe we provided a similar document last year um, on a confidential basis, and we can provide the same same level of information uh, this year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooley. Anything further from committee? All right, well, I'd like to uh, to thank uh, the um, uh, witnesses from the Office of the Comptroller General, and I'll turn to uh, Mr. Cooey if you have any closing statements. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just, just, just briefly, I'd like to thank the committee for their, their time uh, this morning and this afternoon, uh, hearing, their, hearing their concerns and recommendations, and I uh, look forward to seeing the recommendations on the 15, 16 public accounts, um, and looking forward to, uh, to, to taking action so we can improve our, improve our financial statements and overall disclosures uh, to better suit the needs of our residents. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Curie. And with that uh, committee, we will take a brief uh, recess before returning uh, to do our wrap-up. Thank you.